Aloha and happy Aloha Friday, everyone. A very warm welcome to all of you, all of our participants and our panelists. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. This is the sixth and final webinar in our series where we have been introducing and sharing highlights of the 2022 statistical report for the Hawaii State Plan for a data-driven system of care on substance use. It's a mouthful. Okay, this webinar today is focused on two chapters of the, of the statistical report, chapter 11 uh, on substance use and sexual and gender minorities, and chapter three on substance use treatment in general and linkages to primary care. My name is Victoria Fan, and I will be your facilitator for this webinar. So before we get started with our presentation, just a few housekeeping reminders. This is a Zoom webinar event, which means that you, our audience, can see us, but we cannot see you. There are two ways for you to interact with us and also amongst yourselves. The first is through the chat window, which you should be able to see on the Zoom status bar. And the second is through the question and answers window, which you can also access through the Zoom status bar. We very much encourage you and welcome you to post any questions or comments. As, also, as well as to introduce yourselves, that will make the webinar more interactive and add to the discussion. The whole purpose of these webinars is to hear your comments and ideas. Our panel and team will try to answer your questions as they arise, and we've also allocated time for discussion to answer those questions as well. I think the discussion is a great opportunity to make this a dialogue, a two-way dialogue between our audience and our panelists. There will be a few poll questions that will be posted throughout the presentation. There is also a short post-webinar survey at the end that will pop up when you leave the Zoom room. Your feedback is so important to us so that we can improve this webinar series as well as the state plan. And so we ask you to please spend just a minute or two after the webinar ends to please fill out the survey. We would really appreciate it. And finally, uh, we will be providing the slide deck with all of the supplementary material, contact information, and links to all our participants after the webinar. And a recording of this presentation will also be available next week. The recordings for the previous five webinars are also available. And uh, we look forward to sharing the full set of all, of all the recordings with you soon. So again, at this time, we uh, invite you to share your name and organization within the chat. Um, and I will now introduce our panel. Um, so for those of you who are joining us for the first time uh, in this series, our first panelist is John Valera from the Hawaii Department of Health, Alcohol and Drug, Drug Abuse Division. He is the acting administrator of ADAD. And in that role, he is the sponsor for the state plan project. He's served in ADAD in various capacities since 2016. He's a certified planner with the American Institute of Certified Planners. He has a master's in urban planning from UH and a bachelor of science in planning and public administration from USC. Our second panelist is Dr. Jared Euro, also from DOH ADAD. He has a doctor of psychology degree from the US International University. He completed his master's in education from Columbia and his master's in psychology from the California School of Professional Psychology, San Diego. He's a licensed psychologist and he's been at ADAD since 2002, where he serves as chief clinical officer, clinical psychologist supervisor, and currently as acting public health program manager. Our third panelist is Thaddeus Pham. Uh, he received his master's in public health from Johns Hopkins. He's uh, been the viral hepatitis prevention coordinator for DOH within the harm reduction services branch since 2011. He is also co-founder and co-director of the Hep Free Hawaii Coalition, which oversees Hep Free 2030. Um, and in 2018, he was recognized by the National Minority Quality Forum as a 40 under 40 leader in minority health 
and he's currently a Bloomberg Fellow at Johns Hopkins. He approaches public health from a social justice perspective and enhances community partnerships uh, to address health disparities. Okay, our fourth panelist is Melanie Cordova. She obtained her Master's of Public Health and her Master's of Business Administration from the University of Illinois, Chicago. She's currently a program specialist and contract manager within the DOH ADAD, a treatment recovery branch, and is also an acting planner for the Planning Evaluation and Research Data Office. So big welcome and mahalo to our panelists. And also like our previous webinars, we're pleased that our PHAC uh, team members from the Pacific Health Analytics Collaborative have helped uh, to join us today and present our chapter highlights. Uh, today, we have Rachel Antalan. Um, she is a graduate assistant in PHAC, and she holds a Bachelor of Arts in Public Health from UH Manoa. Um, she's got various responsibilities with the State Plan Project, including some of the video uh, editing and multimedia as well as some of the dashboard tutorials, infographics, and various aspects of planning and implementing this webinar series. We're super excited that many of our students have grown into public health professionals. Okay, again, my name is Victoria Fan. I'm your facilitator for today. I'm an associate professor at UH and also the director of our research lab, the UH Pacific Health Analytics Collaborative, and the PI for the UH State Plan for Substance Use. Um, my background is sort of eclectic. I've studied engineering and anthropology at MIT, followed by epidemiology, demography, and health economics at Harvard, and I've been at UH now for the last eight years. Okay, so this presentation is separated into two main parts. So first, our panelists will walk you through highlights uh, from Chapter 11 uh, on sexual and gender minorities, followed by a short discussion, uh, and then we'll walk you through the highlights uh, for chapter three of the report, looking at substance use treatment and primary care integration, again, followed by a short discussion. And again, we encourage you and invite you sincerely to please post any questions or feedback or thoughts, any, any comments you might have uh, in the chat window for our panelists to underst understand your perspectives and also to answer them, and even to answer other people's questions and comments. Um, many of the audience members today are also experts and longtime professionals in this field. And so your feedback is absolutely essential. So like our previous webinars, we have only one hour for this webinar to introduce and highlight some of the findings from the 2022 report. And if you're interested in viewing the current draft of the full report, a link and a password is now being provided to you in the chat window. There were some issues with copying the links in the chat window previously. And so just before the webinar started, we also sent an email with those links. So please check your email if you're having any difficulties accessing the full report. The full report is quite long. And again, this webinar is just a, a snippet. It's almost like an appetizer to hopefully get you excited and more interested to look at the full report. And it's also a consultation draft. And because of that, it's a view only version and not available for download. Um, and uh, finally, uh, the highlights uh, from this webinar will also be provided um, in an infographic format um, available through the Behavioral Health Dashboard. And that link is also being provided to you right now in the chat window and was also in the email um, earlier, earlier today. Okay, so uh, moving, moving on um, to our chapter highlights, um, I just want to give a few reminders for those of you who are joining us for the first time today. And these limitations, we had addressed them previously, but again, these are for someone who's joined us for the first time. Uh, this statistical report uses 18 different data sources. And that these data sources fall into three types or three categories, survey data, clinical data, and administrative data. Each type of data has different pros and cons. And we used the best available data that we had access to when we were finalizing this report in February of this year. Many of these sources are available publicly and a few were available due to the generosity and partnership of our collaborators who gave us access to their data. We are very much aware that there are other data sources which could be more comprehensive or even newer 
Uh, and to the various reasons, we didn't have access to that data at this time. And we certainly hope in the future we might have access in the future. Uh, importantly, this report was built upon a reproducible analytics framework. This makes it easy for us or for DOH to make updates to the report with fairly minimal effort as new data becomes available. And again, if you would like to learn more about the methodology that was employed to produce this report, or open up the statistical report, chapter one has a lot of these details uh, for you to, to enjoy and may help you fall asleep as well. Uh, nevertheless, again, if you are more interested in the details of these data sets, uh, we invite you to open the full report and the appendix. Okay, so now moving on, I want to talk briefly about uh, chapter 11. Before we do that, we will open up with a few poll questions. And uh, the first question is, um, how familiar are you uh, with the substance use issues affecting sexual and gender minorities in the state? And your responses will help our panelists to have a better understanding of who our audience is. Great, thank you to all those who submitted their responses. It looks like I would say the majority are not familiar or somewhat familiar with substance use issues affecting uh, sexual and gender minorities. Okay, next question. Thank you for responding. The next question is, are you directly involved with providing substance use services to sexual and gender minorities? Again, this will help our panelists to get to know you better and better frame how we present the topics. Great, thank you so much all for, for participating. Again, the majority are not providing substance use services to sexual and gender minorities. Okay, so with that, uh, just again, a brief overview of chapter 11 on sexual and gender minorities. Uh, there are two subsections addressing uh, the first one being substance use, uh, substance use, abuse, and dependence, and the second being treatment. And the survey data sources that we use primarily are the NUSDA, the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, and the Youth Risk Behavioral Sur uh, Youth Risk Behavior, Behavior Survey, YURBIS, all these acronyms. Okay, so the, the NUSDA is a national survey data set. Uh, very comprehensive. Uh, it's an in-person survey. Uh, and the YURBIS is a publicly available uh, survey conducted by CDC jointly with the Hawaii Department of Education and Department of Health. And these are collected among ninth through 12th graders in public schools. Uh, and again, there's some limitations that all surveys uh, tend to have. Um, and so if we go to the next slide here, I think we'll see some of the limitations uh, due to the sample size of the NUSDA. We don't have data for any particular single year. We've aggregated them to multiple years. And of course, the population is civilian, uh, non-institutionalized persons, ages 12 um, and above. And uh, the YURBIS, um, again, has some limitations in terms of, like any, any survey, being self-reported. Um, and some limitations in terms of response rates. Okay, so with that, I just I will I'm pleased to now pass it over. Um, I believe um, is it to who, Melanie who yes. will be starting us off. Thank you, Melanie. Thanks, Victoria. All right, so I'll um, go over the next few slides. Um, here, as we can see, this is this slide shows past year alcohol use among individuals 18 years or older in Hawaii by sexual identity. Uh, these are annual averages from 2015 to 2018 and gathered from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health. Uh, as we can see, close to 8 in 10 individuals 18 years or older who identify as bisexual report alcohol use in the past year. This is the highest percentage of use compared to the Hawaii population, which is closer to 6 in 10 and individuals who identify as straight or gay or lesbian. Next slide. Uh, this next slide shows past year meth use among individuals 18 years or older in Hawaii by sexual identity. 
Again, this is from the NUSDA and our annual averages from 2015 to 2018. Uh, for the population of Hawaii, roughly 1% of individuals report past year meth use. Um, however, looking below, ind individuals who identify as gay or lesbian report much higher use, close to 8%, and individuals who identify as bisexual report similarly, with close to 7% reporting past year meth use. Uh, and this slide covers um, data related to high school students in Hawaii by sexual orientation who report ever used prescription drugs without a doctor's prescription. Uh, this data covers 2011 to 2017 and was taken from the Hawaii Yerbis Youth Risk Behavior Survey. As we can see throughout the years, over one in four students who identify as lesbian, gay, or bisexual report having used prescription drugs without a doctor's prescription. Uh, which is much higher compared to individuals who identify as heterosexual. In 2017, this is roughly one in 10. Uh, now I think uh, Rachel will go over the next slide. Hi everyone, um, my name is Rachel Antoine and thank you Melanie um, for that introduction. I'll now present the last three graphs of chapter 11. So um, this graph here shows those who have ever used injectables among public high school students within the state um, and this is bisexual orientation from 2013 to 2017. So in that time period, public high school students who identified as lesbian, gay, um, and bisexual had the highest percentage of individuals who had ever used injectables within the state. Um, and then next slide, please. So this slide represents the current marijuana use among public high school students in the state of Hawaii bisexual orientation from 2011 to 2017. So um, during that time, public high school students who identified as lesbian, gay, or bisexual had the highest percentage of current marijuana use in the state of Hawaii, um, as you can see in the blue. Okay, next slide, please. And this is the last graph for chapter 11. It shows those who needed and those who received treatment for illicit drug or alcohol use among individuals 18 years and older in the state of Hawaii by sexual identity. And this is from 2015 to 2018. So over 2015 to 2018, the average annual percentage of those who needed illicit drug or alcohol treatment was highest among individuals 18 years and above who identified as gay or lesbian in the state of Hawaii. And additionally, the average annual percentage of those who received illicit drug or alcohol treatment was highest among individuals who identified as bisexual. Thank you and very think, much. Yes, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Melanie, and thank you, Rachel. So we're now at the discussion portion of the presentation for chapter 11. We have about 10 minutes or so. Um, and at this time, we have some discussion questions to get us started here. Um, so our first uh, discussion question, I think, is there a next slide here? Um, and we'd first open it up to uh, Thaddeus Pham as our subject matter expert to maybe get us started with sharing uh, maybe some of the key highlights on substance use among sexual, sexual and gender minorities that he would like to share with our audience today. So over to you, Thaddeus. Awesome. Thanks, Dr. Fan, and thanks everyone for joining us today. So um, as you could see, the, the, the data is already kind of pretty clear that there are disparities among our sexual and gender minorities. Um, something you might already notice when we looked at this is actually the data that was presented only focuses on sexual orientation. So we will note that there is additional data available that we'll be presenting in um, the chapter that um, our work group is going to provide that includes transgender data as well, um, and that the disparities also exist, um, usually more so around substance use for our transgender youth and adults. Um, and, and to speak to that, I think, uh, you know, it's uh, something to be mindful of when folks are, you know, looking at the data and considering the research around this community in terms of their access to substance use and uh, prevention and treatment is that although we usually conflate all of these communities into one umbrella um, group, um, usually it's you know, put together as LGBTQIA+, or in this case, we call it sexual and gender minority. Um, each community within this broader umbrella has its own specific disparities that we've seen. So um, use of different substances will vary 
for example, among lesbian and bisexual women as compared to a gay cisgender men, right? So although we do see the data usually pooled uh, for various reasons, I think an important thing to note is that there are disparities when compared to cisgender and heterosexual cohorts, but also um, disparities and differences within each individual subpopulation. Um, so I think that's the main thing that I would point out when we are looking at the needs and the, um, the impacts of substance use on this community. So hopefully that made sense, uh, Dr. Ban, and please let me know if you have any clarifying questions on that. Thank you, Thaddeus. We'll move on to our next discussion question here. Um, the next question is, how has COVID-19 uh, impacted substance use and substance use service delivery among sexual and gender minorities uh, in the state? And well, again, we'll start off with Thaddeus and then open it up to others in the panel. Great. Well, you know, uh, it's kind of early for us in terms of, you know, hard data to see the, the true impact of COVID-19, especially if we're looking at Yerbis data or similar surveys, um, because those are still coming out. However, anecdotally, what I can share is that, uh, and not surprisingly, is we think that substance use is increasing, especially among our sexual and gender minority youth in Hawaii, um, as means of coping with the various stressors that came with the COVID-19 pandemic. So even before that happened, again, we saw these disparities play out. And when we consider the minority stress model, which looks at how minority communities are, um, are disparately impacted and how they cope with that, uh, we were already seeing you know, increased rates of suicidality, mental health issues, behavioral health issues, bullying and violence among our local youth who identify as sexual and gender minorities. And not surprisingly, we saw a, a, an, an increase in substance use, perhaps as a way of coping with these various stressors. So with the additional impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, we're anecdotally, like I said, seeing and hearing more of our youth starting to use as um, ways of coping. Um, uh, in terms of service delivery, from, you know, again, from what we hear anecdotally in the community and, you know, from our continued discussions with folks um, in our quarterly meetings and in our other work groups um, with the section on gender minority work group, um, service delivery is abysmally poor for this particular community in Hawaii, um, especially regards to folks who have um, um, of gender diverse experiences. So people who do not align their, uh, you know, their birth, uh, by sex, their sex assigned at birth with their gender identity. So I think um, with COVID-19 already decreasing access in general to healthcare, um, it really just exacerbated the already poor uh, service uh, availability for this community. Thank you, Thaddeus. Uh, John or Jared or Melanie? Well, I'm just curious. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, just a question to poll the group at this point. Um, what other services or programs do you know of in your communities that give substance use services to those with to sex and gender minorities? Um, you know, we, we hear in Oahu there, there are a few like Hawaii Health and Harm Reduction Center, Waikiki Health, the Lavender Clinic, and uh, Transcend Maui. Um, but then, you know, I'm not so sure if there are others. Um, so, yeah, if this is your, perhaps your opportunity to kind of uh, give some input in, into what programs you know that are out there. Thank you so much. Great, thank uh, you. Oh, go ahead, Darius. Oh, I was just, I just I respond to John and say thanks for asking that question. You know, apart from what John has listed, um, I would love to hear about, um, you know, residential programs because that was a major uh, thing that had come up for folks, especially for our uh, transgender or gender non-binary folks who are seeking services. Great, thank you. Um, Thaddeus, um, in your, I believe in the chapter that you authored, co-authored, um, you talked about like a framework for a cycle of care. And I'm kind of curious as to what your reflections are on as to that framework compared to the current cycle of care. Yeah, great. Thanks, John. So that framework, um, the cycle of care framework was uh, adapted from other frameworks, especially I think of the Rhode Island model of care. Um, but it was 
also grounded in the stages of change. Um, so I think that's where that opportunity came up. And I, I think the important philosophical underpinning for the particular framework that we had proposed was that, um, that it's not that linear process, but really that cyclical one that allows our folks to kind of um, not feel there's only one way of progressing forward in, in terms of addressing their substance use, that they can relapse or you know, come back and still be um, moving, uh, moving towards their goals around substance use and, um, and reducing that. So I think that was the major thing. I think it was um, allowing the community to have that feeling of um, empowerment in their own process towards their substance use um, uh, treatment journey. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah, yes. Thaddeus, I have a question for you. You know, to what degree are cultural factors involved? You know, when you look at working with these individuals, and I'm just wondering when you think of, uh, you know, the degree to which cultural factors actually have impact, are there some cultures where maybe it's a little bit more comfortable, you know, in terms of their orientation versus others? And as far as, you know, the openness or willingness to seek any kind of services or support. That's a great question. I, that, of course, that's a question from you, Jared. I love that question. So yeah. So when we consider, you know, even though this this chapter is, supposed, is focused on sexual gender minorities, we acknowledge that um, the intersectional impact of things like um, immigrant status, uh, uh, race and ethnicity, Native Hawaiian and indigeneity all play into this as well. So to speak to your question, Jared, you know, for folks who identify as sexual gender minorities and are part of a, a cultural community that are not as accepting of those identities, um, we, we do see, and again, I, I don't have the, you know, the survey data, but really anecdotally and the feedback from community is that that increases the likelihood that they won't seek care, right? Because they're already stigmatized just by, in virtue of being in their, their, cultural, um, their cultural kind of community. And so they will be less likely to seek care because of stigma around that. Um, mm. When we speak to specific culturally around sexual and gender minority peoples, um, then that's already um, an issue when folks don't feel safe, you know, with their pronouns, with their names, or if they feel judged when they access care. So um, we're a fairly mm -hmm. tight community, I would say, in Hawaii. So as soon as someone hears a provider is not um, um, welcoming, then that provider is no longer an option for many people because they do not want to even try. Well, and the vulnerability, when we talk about risk and protective factors, whether it be in the prevention field or with the treatment field, or you're looking at it holistically, there's always the concern that that really places individuals at greater risk. Exactly. And I think that's, yeah, I think it's something that had come up a lot in the discussion for our particular chapter is also to not, um, I love that you brought up protective factors that, you know, oftentimes we are very deficit focused and looking at disparities, but how can we really amplify the, the protective and resiliency factors in our communities, right? Because a lot of our folks also are fantastic and they're thriving and they've made it through despite all these stressors. So how do we amplify those opportunities and, um, practices that folks have already done. Thank you. Great question. Thank, Jared. Yeah, thank you. This is a really valuable discussion. I see people entering their comments in the chat window, and we really appreciate those um, thoughts as well. We'll move on to our next question here. Um, and our, our third question is, how does the data presented uh, in this report today reflect or differ from what you've experienced while providing services and maybe what data would be needed to better provide services in the future? Love this question. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, the data bears out kind of what we're hearing in many ways. Um, I do think the opportunities for data would be to do more qualitative research um, on uh, SGM communities to better provide context. I feel like I've already said it a million times. You heard me say the phrase anecdotally here or from the community. And I think that that qualitative aspect can really um, contextualize the survey data to, to identify opportunities and nuances that will make services more aligned with what folks need. Um, I'll just note like when we presented similar data 
um, to our local communities who identify as sexual and gender minority, they shared back, you know, Thaddeus, this is great, but this is very colonial. And um, what about story, talk story? What about cultural concepts of information sharing and gathering? So I, I, I believe, you know, strongly that if we can incorporate and integrate qualitative research into um, our, our assessments and evaluation, I think that will provide us more power in terms of nuance and effective programming. And I'm also going to know, I'm going to put my email in the chat. I do have another meeting. I'm so sorry. Uh, but I want to thank you all for your time today as well. And if folks want to respond, I am still here for another uh, few minutes. Thank you, Tha Thaddeus. Yeah, um, we've been doing, uh, uh, looking at qualitative studies for the past few years. It's very interesting to hear that comment you know, possible uh, continue continuation of certain qualitative studies, yeah. Thank you, John. Thank you so much, Thaddeus. And we know that you have another meeting to go to, but happy Aloha Friday and have a great weekend. For the rest of you, we still have another half to go, so please don't leave just yet. Um, and with that, maybe we will shift now to our next section of our webinar today. Um, as we transition now, we'll talk about chapter three, which is about substance use and treatment access and linkages to primary care. Okay, so um, we'll start off with a few polls. And again, just to familiarize us with you, is if you could please tell us how familiar are you with substance use treatment issues uh, in the state? Please fill out the poll. Great, thank you so much. It looks like the majority of you are somewhat familiar or very familiar uh, with substance use treatment issues. So that's wonderful. You are all the, the experts here. Okay, next question is, um, are you directly involved with providing substance use treatment services? Great, thank you. So it looks like the majority of you are not providing treatment services um, currently. Thank you so much. Okay, so we'll now move on. Um, and uh, like the other chapter, uh, we just give a quick overview of the data sources for this chapter. So for chapter three um, on treatment, we primarily use the NASDA again, as well as the WITS, the Web Infrastructure for Treatment Services, which is the electronic health record used by ADAD for ADAD treatment service providers, as well as the, the TEDS, the TEDS-A specifically, which is the treatment episode data set for admissions. Okay, so the NUSDA is a survey, as we talked about previously, um, and the WITS is a valuable electronic health record administrative and also a clinical uh, data source that is not publicly available and was extracted and compiled by ADAD um, and our team. And it's a very valuable data source, uh, which has data about the population receiving treatment services, uh, primarily through ADAD uh, funding, but other public funding sources as well, potentially. Um, and we were fortunate to um, have access to the entire data set um, although it is a very large, uh, actually a database with uh, several, several tables and uh, organization and management of it is quite challenging as well. Okay, the TEDS is a national data set, which is publicly available. It compiles data from treatment facilities, also receiving uh, primarily state funding. And uh, th this data set is a clinical data set focused on admissions and discharges, it is not, a, is not available at the individual level. And like many national data sets, it tends to be lagged by a few years. In this case, the most recent data is from 2019, which was released in the fourth quarter of last year. Okay, so this slide just summarizes some of the limitations of these data sets. All data sets have limitations. And uh, again, we invite you to look at the full statistical report as well as the appendix to learn more about these data sets. And if you have suggestions or ideas about what could be done with this data, or if you have new data sources that you'd like to suggest, please, please get in touch with us. We would love to, to get in touch. 
Okay, so now at this time, I'll be passing it over to uh, John Valera to give us some highlights um, from chapter three. So over to you, John. Thank you, Victoria. <clears throat> so this uh, slide here, I have a few slides and I'll pass it on to Jared. So this slide talk is from the NISDA. Um, this is a, a national uh, publicly available data set. Uh, show it highlights for from 2015 to 2018, the average percentage of individuals who needed but did not receive treatment in the past year for alcohol, illicit drugs and illicit drugs or alcohol uh, was higher for the state of Hawaii than the US. State of Hawaii is by the green, is the green and US is the blue. Now, note why these percentages seem small, you know, they're under 10%. Note it, that it's a, this is graph shows a percentage of the total population of Hawaii compared to the total US population. So for the bottom green bar there, illicit drug alcohol <clears throat> or alcohol, for example, the bottom green bar, around 7%, that equals, you figure a, pop, a population of 1.3 million people, that's about 91,000 people. Okay, so this treatment measure is also referred to as a treatment gap sort of indicator. Next, please. Okay, so this one is the same data set, NISDA looking, but just at Hawaii, this, but this time by different age brackets. Now, what's interesting is that the emerging adulthood population, ages 18 to 25, ha seems to have the highest annual uh, average percentage for needing treatment for illicit drugs or alcohol in the past year and for receiving treatment for illicit drugs or alcohol in the past year in the state of Hawaii compared to other age groups. Now, emerging adulthood, typically when our division reports out data, uh, it's, we typically uh, report it out as adolescents, which is uh, under 18, and adults, which is over 18. But we wish to also study the emerging adult bracket, um, which this is pretty salient. Next, please. Now, this is a spider graph from our WITS data set um, over a two and a half year period. Um, the numbers are, so this is the number of treatment services. So what we would, I would, we would tend to call service encounters. Okay, so this is not the number of treatment clients, but it's the number of encounters that uh, our ADAD contracted providers have rendered uh, through our contracts. So it's, again, this population encounter quantity is not necessarily representative of the treatment encounter totals in the state as a whole. Um, but it highlights that in the, right around the pre-COVID pre era, adolescent school-based and adult treatment services were the top two categories of SUD encounters rendered. Uh, school base is typically intensive outpatient and outpatient services, while the adult services tend to be a wider range of services that we offer um, uh, indirectly, including from outreach to screening and assessment to higher intensity services like residential. But the, it's, it says the highlight is that the adult treatment services had the highest number of services among all population groups. Okay, next please. So this is a, another spider graph, same WITS data set, same two and a half year period, this time by the number of treatment clients. And so you'll see that uh, adult substance use treatment services had the highest number of clients among all population groups. Um, there's also a significant number of clients that have received early intervention services, which includes services like outreach testing um, on around HIV or hepatitis C, you know, outreach and testing, um, as well as case management services. 
All right. Next slide. Now defer to Dr. Ural. Thank you very much, John. So here we have another spider graph, and this one indicates charge amounts by population code for the state of Hawaii from January 18th to June 2020. So this is a little bit more recent. We go ahead and look at ranging anywhere really from zero to 30 million. Adult substance abuse treatment services, as we can see, really is at the highest level um, on our spider graph. And so we're looking at approximately what, two, 24 million, uh, between 24 and 30 million. And then if we look at the next highest level, we're looking at adolescent substance abuse treatment services, which in fact are school-based. So again, indicator that this really highlights those two with regards to charge amounts by population code for early intervention services. Next slide, please. You know, the way to visualize this, um, for those who may not be familiar with this type of um, uh, graph, I almost like to think of it as a longitudinal pie slice, which may sound like a very interesting description, but please recognize that when you look at the different colors, it's really representing almost like if you think of a, a round pie, for those of you who are familiar with like pie charts and the wedges and they represent um, a percentage of the pie, think of that round pie moving over time from 2015 to 2019. And so this gives you a sense of treatment admissions by primary substance use in the state of Hawaii for the period of 2015 to 2019. So if we really wanna look at the areas that stand out, if you go ahead and look at you know, alcohol, which is really not a surprise. And I think this is something that we know, uh, not only anecdotally, but we certainly know by data over the years. Um, also, if we were to look at meth, as well as marijuana or hashish. Um, you look at the amount in terms of the colors that they occupy really in terms of what I call this longitudinal pie graph. So again, this really indicates what's happened between 2015 and 2019. A little bit of a decrease in terms of admission, which is interesting if you think that it ranges from zero to 6,000. Um, to some degree, the trend lines show that they are heading downwards, but there may be more of an explanation for why this is. So if we could go ahead and have the next slide. So here we look at treatment admissions by age and admission and primary substance use in the state of Hawaii for 2019. And again, if you go ahead and look out for the different age groups, we start off with from 12 to 14, um, all the way in different bands for years of the age groups, all the way up to 65 years and older. And this is our count all the way from zero to 300 and higher. And again, if you look at meth, meth certainly occupies, you know, a very, you know, a very large chunk of all of this. If you look at, there's still other areas. If you look at marijuana and hashish, but again, meth stands out. Next slide, please. Treatment admissions by referral source in the state of Hawaii, again, for the years from 2015 to 2019. So we're going to look ahead in terms of the number of admissions on the vertical from zero to 6,000, and then progressing along from 2015 to 2019. Um, looking at referral source, we can see that the largest number of referrals tend to be inv individual, and this includes self-referrals. Uh, but it does refer to other areas. So if you look at whether it's a court, you know, the criminal justice referrals that may take place or other community referrals, and there's some other areas as well. But again, interesting trend line. Notice that it, we actually see a decrease. Next slide. And we are now ready for the discussion section. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Victoria. Thank you so much, Jared and John for that very excellent overview of chapter three. So we'll start now with our discussion. We have about 10 minutes um, for a little bit less than 10 minutes for discussion. Um, and so we'll start with our first question, but also welcome the audience to ask any questions you have about the data that was just presented. So to John, Jared, uh, and maybe Melanie even, um, what are some key highlights on substance use treatment that you'd like to share? Go ahead, John. Oh, um, since this is the segment on primary care integration. Um, 
you know, we, the, the data analytics team didn't really have access to, you know, physician workforce data that's more covered in the um, uh, primary care integration chapter. And I apologize, uh, Dr. Kiyokawa, Dr. Bush aren't here, but however, um, they did highlight some of the challenges um, in terms of the, the uh, integration. Basically, I believe that that in order to address and, and reach the tens of thousands of folks as that need treatment, but are not getting it, as the NISA data set suggests, um, the substance use professionals, behavioral health professionals alone can't do it. Uh, we need to partner up with the primary care sector and um, who, the primary, uh, we're aware that the primary care sector also has uh, their challenges of their own with respect to uh, physician deficits, uh, physician shortages, uh, not just for the physicians, but across other specialties. And we're hearing that it also affects certain categories of nurses, registered nurses um, and other um, uh, medical professionals. And so, you know, working in Hawaii, we're hearing working in Hawaii is, is challenging. And, um, and when we add uh, behavioral health or, or substance use clients and the need for them to constantly be engaged in treatment and to stick to uh, the, the, the treat, uh, continue to receive treatment services, um, it's an intensity that, you know, perhaps not many uh, primary care physicians are ready for or, or were necessarily equipped for. And so, you know, I think uh, in order to integrate, uh, we need to uh, better have better relationships with the medical schools and the different nursing programs in order to better uh, increase the articulation of the substance use needs uh, of those that are struggling with substance use um, and figuring out how best we can uh, do that so that uh, the medical professionals themselves are more equipped to, to be ready to handle um, or, or to, uh, to administer care to uh, substance use clients. Jared, do you have, any, have anything to add to this? Yeah, I do. And actually it's... Um kind of um, tag teaming really on what you've talked about. You know, one of the things that struck me is I was looking at the NISDA survey, survey and it said an estimated average of 91,000 or 7.8% of individuals in the state of Hawaii needed treatment in the past year for illicit drug or alcohol use from 2015 to 2018. Uh, that's one of the tables, but it said only 17,000 or 1.4% 1 individuals were estimated to have received treatment. <laughs> And you know when Victoria talked about doing the deeper dive, that's why when we get together like this, it's really to get you to ask questions of, well, why does the data say this? And what are the hypotheses? And I actually looked at Tammy's questions. And I actually do have, you know, sort of what I believe is the decline for self-referrals and treatment. I think a lot, number one, does have to do with what John talked about. You know, when you look at how, um, when, when we talk about primary care, to the degree to which, you know, individuals, you know, in the medical field screen and then make referrals, because medical professionals and physicians in particular tend to be very busy. And so then the question is, do they have time or do their staff have time in terms of coordination of care? This is something we often think of as, you know, the province of social workers and care coordinators. So that's one element that I think is really key to what I call a system of care. The other thing that I think is really important is, and it would make a great poll question, I wish I had thought of it earlier, is how many people across all fields are trained in what I call multidisciplinary or transdisciplinary models of care? And I'm not sure all are with the exception of maybe social work. <laughs> I think as social workers, social workers are trained to work with all disciplines. And I think it is sometimes variable the degree to which 
other professional disciplines are trained to work actively in understanding what other disciplines do or even screening with an idea that other disciplines may be needed. And so when I look at where healthcare is, uh, when I look at where behavioral health care is, even between mental health and addiction, one of the things that has struck me, and I've been in the field for several decades now, is the degree to which people are trained in what I call sort of that holistic model of, it's not in my field, but do I look for it and do I have concerns about it? And so I will say part of my training in marriage and family psychology was in system psychology not only learning about my discipline, but the expectation is the idea that you also look across the board. And so I wonder to what degree when we look at the training that goes on in different programs, whether that's emphasized. And it's just something that I think is important to look at. So I don't know, John, Melanie, or anyone else from the audience would really be interested, but workforce shortages nowadays, um, globally, I also know is a contributing factor. So would love to hear from others. Uh, and thank you, nurses. Yes. Good to hear that. The uh, chat window has been very, very um, interactive. And I, I thank everyone for providing their comments and questions. And I, as a faculty member, I often tell my students that questions are much more important than answers. And so I really appreciate the questions that people have asked here. Michelle Park asked, what drugs are included in the other stimulants category? And um, the data are very detailed. And uh, Michelle, what we'll do is we'll uh, get the specific answer to that question uh, to you probably by email. Um, Francis Chan asked, are there statistics on the socioeconomic status of those who needed but did not receive treatment? And I believe this would be the data within the WIT. So I'm going to refer this question over to John or Jared to answer that. I believe, well, the question on needing but not receiving, I believe that was a NISDA uh, table. I'm sorry. So yeah, that's, that's I'm right. sure that, that I'm sure they have socioeconomic breakdowns for that. But that's a great question. Actually, um, I see Jacqueline uh, and Sarah from our team who were analyzing the NUSDA. Uh, I'm just going to call on them to see if they might be able to share with us if they recall uh, from the NUSDA what the socioeconomic variable uh, was. And possibly can you even add that to the... Well, yeah. Yes, we'll, we'll add it to our list of items to follow up with. Sure. Um, but it, thank you. Thank you, Francis, for that excellent question. Um, and um, OK, well, we'll move on now to our, our next uh, question here, um, discussion question six. And um, the question is, how has the COVID-19 pandemic impacted substance use treatment services uh, in the state? Well, one thing we could definitely talk about here is, you know, just the increase in uh, telework, telemedicine, and um, you know, uh, previously pre-COVID, the tele re reimbursement in telemedicine was minimal, um, but one, but it, it has accelerated across the healthcare system, not just for SUD services. And um, so, you know, there's obviously a lot of room for improvement here. And um, I believe uh, Mickey uh, Kilkawa in their chapter talked a little bit more about it, but, um, you know, how can we continue to provide telehealth, uh, telephone visits, uh, and, and possibly increase reimbursement for that. Uh, there, there's a lot of fronts to watch because there's some federal regs and some state regs, and um, um, you know, so to 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 that some policy actions that may be involved um, because it seems and it seems that telehealth is here to stay, and. Uh, Particularly if you're in a remote area, telehealth may be an option, particularly of the service, if it's 
if if the service is appropriate for it. So, yeah. Great, thank you so much, John. And I, I, I just noticed John also provided a very detailed explanation of what other stimulants are as defined in the TEDs. Um, thank you very much, John, for that, that definition. And again, all of the definitions are also available in the full report as well. Uh, the last, oh, another question here from Francis is, are there centralized resource directories available for cross-disciplinary referrals? And then there's a second comment here from Jennifer Campbell about the challenges of self-referral. And we invite you to read, read this valuable comment as well. Um, we are at the top of the hour. Uh, the question by Francis Chan is also very important, but again, we'll probably have to table it for a future uh, discussion. Um, again, this is the last webinar in our series of six webinars and the recordings of all of our webinars um, uh, will be made available on our YouTube channel. And uh, we're so grateful um, on behalf of the UH Pacific Health Analytics Collaborative, we're so grateful for this partnership with the Department of Health, with John and Jared and Melanie and many others in, in ADAD. And we've had a, a wonderful time in the past uh, three, three years now uh, working on this project. Um, and I want to thank sincerely all of all of our partners and all of you for attending uh, this, this series of webinars. So as we mentioned, um, our contacts are here in the slide deck. We can just jump straight to the contact slide here. Uh, and we sincerely invite you to please send us any questions or comments. Uh, and we'll certainly try to follow up with you on the additional questions and comments that are all very val valuable um, that you've asked. Um, all of these points that you've shared are so valuable. We, we will try to incorporate them as much as possible in, into the statistical report and the state plan. Okay. Like life, reports are always a work in progress. Uh, the report sometimes feels final, but things can always be better. That's just how life is. Um, and so with that, we want to end here. There is a, a post-webinar survey. We would be grateful if you could please I spend a few minutes to just answer just a couple of questions about the webinar. And of course the feedback will be extremely helpful um, for us to improve uh, the rest of the, the plan. Uh, and so this, this concludes um, our state plan uh, webinar series. I wanna thank everyone for their attendance and participation. And I wanna wish you all a happy Aloha Friday and a wonderful weekend. So mahalo everyone and take care. Thank you, everyone. Aloha. Aloha. Enjoy your weekend. Aloha, everyone.